Okay, so now we are finishing up the chapter on determinants, I think, with an important and useful fact about determinants. Okay, so the following theorem ties together all of the work that we have done in this section, this section about determinants. Okay, let A be an n by n matrix, square matrix, in other words. The following statements are equivalent. The determinant of A is not zero. The matrix is invertible. The equation A equals zero has a unique solution. The columns of A form a linearly independent set of n vectors. And the same is true for the rows of A. Okay. So all these things are equivalent. <coughs> so as usual, when you want to prove a whole bunch of equivalences, you show that you generally show that you know one implies two, two implies three, three implies four, or four and four b, and four implies one, and then whichever one is true, automatically all the others will be true, right? And you just choose whichever direction is easiest for you to prove, uh, and in this book they've chosen to lay them out in the order that they found easiest to prove: one to two to three to four to one. Okay, so first of all, proving one to two. Proving that if the determinant of A is not zero, then the matrix A is invertible. Okay. Well, so we need to. So we're assuming we're assuming that the determinant of A is not zero, and we're trying to prove that the matrix is invertible. While the matrix is invertible, A is invertible if we can find another matrix B such that A B equals I H definition. In this case, we would write B equals A inverse. When it is invertible, we write B is the A is A to the minus one. We know that A. Sorry. I mean, in fact. Sorry, we know that A has adjunct of A equals the determinant of A, so as you did when we were figuring out that this is, the, this is the expression for the inverse, you just divide both sides of this equation, which is, this equation, by the way, is always true, even if the determinant is, is, even if the determinant is zero, this equation is always true. But since it's not zero, because we're assuming it's not zero, we can divide both sides by the determinant of A. And then we get A times this matrix equals identity matrix. And so that means that that is the inverse. So we have an inverse, it's that. Okay. Now we're going to go from two to three. So we're going to assume that A is invertible, and we're going to prove, so we're going to forget about one for now. Forget about one, or we're assuming, we're not assuming one anymore, we're just only assuming two is true. The matrix A is invertible, and we're going to prove that AX equals zero implies X equals zero. Okay. The reason it's important to now, you know, we proved that one implies two. The reason it's now important to act like we don't know that one is true when going from two to three is so that when we want to use this theorem, we want, all these, we want to be able to assume any one of these things and get to all the others. So if, we know, if all we know is that two is true, we want to be able to get to one being true. So we need to prove that if two, if two is true and that's all we know, then it, it, two implies three, and three implies four, and four implies one. So now we're assuming that only two is true, that's all we know, and we're going to prove three. Okay, so assume that the inverse of A exists. We're going to show... so. Assume that A is invertible, that means the inverse exists. We're going to show that A equals 0 has a unique solution, X equals 0. Well, you take X equals 0, you multiply both sides by the determinant, by, sorry, by the inverse, and any matrix times the 0 matrix is just the any matrix times the 0 vector is just the 0 vector. And here we have A inverse times A, which is identity. Identity times any vector is just the vector itself, so you have X equals 0. Easy. Okay, now we're going to forget about 1 and 2 and assume just 3, that the equation A equals 0 has a unique solution, X equals 0, and we're going to prove 4. That the columns of A form a linearly independent set of n vectors. Okay. So, we're assuming that AX equals 0 has only the trivial solution, X equals 0. Now, the product AX is a linear combination of the columns of A, right? That's the definition, well, that's one, of the, that's the one way of defining matrix multiplication is to say that a, AX is defined as a linear combination of the columns of A where the scalars where the scalars in the linear coefficients of the linear combination are the entries in x. Now, if the only solution to x equals 0 is x equals 0, then you're saying that the only linear combination of the columns of A that sums to 0 is the trivial one, which is just the definition of linear independence, right? OK. Now we go from 4 to 1. So we're going to forget everything, assume just that the columns of A form a linearly independent set of n vectors, and we're going to prove that the determinant of A is not equal to 0. So, okay. Since the columns of A are linearly independent, 
the system, the system say ax equals zero, can be reduced to i x equals zero by Gauss reduction, right? Okay, so we can reduce a to i to the identity matrix by Gauss reduction because the columns are linearly independent, so we don't end up with any free variables. We just have pivot, 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 pivot. Okay. Now, the determinant of the identity matrix is 1. We know that. Although the Gauss reduction operations change the value of the determinant, it is only by scaling with an un other non-zero as constants. Remember that the three Gauss oper reduction operations, they either, they, you know, you multiply a row by a scalar, you multiply the term by the scalar, you swap two rows, that gives you a minus 1, and you um, add a multiple of one row to another, that doesn't change the determinant. So the Gauss reduction operations do change the value of the term, but only by scaling by another non-zero constant. So if so, if you reduce a you reduce a to i by Gauss reduction, the determinant of i is one, and the determinant of a then must be some non-zero constant times one. So it's something non-zero. Okay. So that means the original matrix must also have a non-zero determinant. Okay, oh, not equal to zero. Okay, this is, this is enough to complete the proof. We've gone one to two to three to four. So we've gone one to two to three, two to three, three to four, four to one. So you can choose any one of these, one, two, three, four, and you can get to any of the other ones. It says you should try some of the other links to practice. I suppose do that if you feel like it. The only other thing to add is, well, that there's this 4B that the same is that the columns of A form a linearly independent set of n vectors, but the rows also form a set of linearly independent vectors. Well, that's because when you take, that's because you could repeat all of this argument, right, but with A transpose instead of A. And then you'd have the term of A transpose is not equal to zero. Because the term of A equals the term of A transpose. You then have the term of A transpose is not equal to zero. The matrix A transpose is invertible. The equation A transpose x equals zero has a unique solution x equals zero. The columns of A transpose form a linearly independent set of n vectors, but the columns of A transpose are just the rows of A. So that's why 4B is, is equivalent to 4. OK. And that's the end of the section on determinants. Next, we're going to go on to differential equations. So we're going to leave linear algebra, well, we're going to stop learning new things about linear algebra and simply use it in solving differential equations. Okay.